Hello and welcome to the Holy Hour Podcast, the All Cure Podcast, bi-weekly. I'm Gavin, and uh, welcome. Hope everyone's doing good out there. This is the long-awaited Artifacts episode, where we get to play Indiana Jones and decide what goes into the Cure Museum of our lives and others. And uh, yeah, this is an exciting one. I'm, I'm really happy. I know I say this is going to be a great episode at the top of each episode. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one, and I feel like this is going to be a great one. we got lots of great contributions from from listeners and people on social media out there, um, different forms of emails and just one-off statements on social media and audio clips. And I got a, a sweet recording I was able to, to lock down with Chaz when we were hanging out in person of his many cool artifacts. So lots in store for you. And um, yeah, like I said, this was one that we um, threw out quite a while ago. So apologies to people that did write in and send in clips that thought I totally forgot about you. Not the case, but there's, you know, there's been a lot of um, kind of time relevant issues and um episodes that we've kind of had to do when we did them the hall of fame the uh live shows the uh what, what do we else we untimely passing of cure members anniversaries of our podcast there's just been a lot of a lot of stuff we had to do when we did it um so this kind of got pushed to the side because um it's nice to have an episode where we can step back again and just kind of cure reminisce and think about the past and uh and what what all this means to us why are we still doing this why are we still care about this band and the little things and the knickknacks we have and uh, and in that time it's been kind of cool to have more time just to kind of sit on the idea and think about it um like i said when this all started this was initially my brother's idea you might remember my brother from from uh, episode two, I think, maybe, really super early on, I had a discussion with him before we even knew what the podcast was exactly. He and I talked about the Smiths and the Cure a lot, um, him being in military school, and then later had him back on for the Love Cats episode. But, um, you know, it's kind of his thing, and, and uh, we got a really nice letter from him um, talking about he's a curator at the National Marine Museum um, in Virginia, in Quantico there. And um, so I figured, you know, the idea stemmed off of him in the sense of, uh, you know, what is everyone's cure artifact? And I like the ideas. The Hall of Fame stuff started to snowball more. It's like we even touched on it in one of the, I think the Hall of Fame episode was like, well, what, would, what should they put into the exhibit if we had the ultimate cure artifact? So that was fun to think about. But then there's also, we've dabbled in just personal collections, and everybody, I feel like Cure fans tend to be collectors, and there's a lot of that you see on the social media where everybody has their collections of some sort, or just maybe not even a full-on collection, but just one or two things that really represents their Cure love and something that they've, they've just acquired somehow over the years that they really cherish more than other stuff, and... um and and they always love to share it, and I love seeing it on on Instagram in particular. And uh, I think that kind of stemmed along those lines. Somebody posted one of those old uh, the high single, you know, the artwork for high, that little bird thing. I always figured as a bird or some sort, but I don't know. But um, that little bird thing that they sold these little crappy necklaces of around the time. I remember ordering it from the back of a magazine, and uh, and just loved the damn thing. It fit in like terrible 90s fashion you know where you could wear it with some open paisley shirt with a t-shirt under it or something you know but uh of course mine broke fairly early on and i was devastated i tried to bring it back to life many times and it just fell apart more and more but i saw somebody had it on there and i was jealous thinking man if i still had that that would be amazing because uh I just have so many weird memories wrapped into how happy i was as a child when i got that in the mail and uh wore it for those four weeks or whatever before it broke but um yeah so little things like that and it's just weird the longer um i sat on the idea of this episode of what is a cure artifact you know to you uh how much it changes to everybody else and that's kind of the cool fascination with this and i didn't really flat out throw out the request in a 
too defining way, um, just kind of like, what is your most cherished cure artifact? And, uh, and it's kind of cool to see the different responses and approaches people took to it. Um, we got a lot of like records and such that were just a missing kind of holy grail piece to their collection. Um, and then you have people that have specific memories wrapped into things that, you know, it might not be something that's incredibly rare, but it could be something that just hit them at the right time. And their regular copy of Standing on the Beach could be their most uh, cherished, you know, artifact because that's what kickstarted it all. And, um, or just a friend that gave them something. So we're going to hear whole bunches of, of cool, quick little stories great part is they're all fairly short, so we're just going to kind of plow through them and uh, see what everybody sent in and uh, contributed as far as what their most cherished cure artifact is. So buckle up. This is going to be a fun one. And um, yeah, get comfy. Here we go. All right, so I figured the best way to start would be right at the top, once again with my brother, since it was his idea, and uh, he really, if you're going to ask somebody what makes a great artifact, the curator in a national museum seems like the guy to do it, right? So, um, you know, I think he, he, he has always done this, has a great knack for it, you know? Um, when, even before he had this job, this is what he did with like our grandfather's military uniforms and stuff in the house. I mean, it really, when you think of somebody that has the dream job, he's the guy I always reference. It'd be like if this was my job, you know, recording conversations about care and just babbling about the care. Um, it really couldn't be more perfect for him. So I figured he would be a great place to start. I asked him, what, what would you, how would you define an artifact that would go into this cure museum? as a official curator and a term that he holds very seriously and personally and hates when it gets mis misused, you know, when someone just curates their, uh, cabinet of cereal boxes, you know, he's not a fan of that. So, um, so he takes it very seriously. Um, but he's a very laid back dude. And, uh, he wrote us this nice letter that I'm going to read for you now that, that kind of sets his, his approach to, what an artifact is and what defines it. And, you know, as we've done this, and like I said on the top of this, uh, everyone's kind of idea is different. So this is what he uses as a criteria and kind of paints the picture for us. So he writes, Hey, Gavin, deciding what makes something a meaningful artifact is one of the main things a curator does, but it, sometimes it gets more complicated than you might think, particularly with cultural or memorabilia items. For example, what is the difference in value between a mint condition 1983 army toy that has never been opened versus the same one that has been played with until it broke, but belonged to a kid that went on to become a decorated war hero, a toy that shaped a life, or a toy that is a collectible? In collecting artifacts, a curator and museum usually tend to skew two ways. First, there are those who simply collect. They are your... Star Wars aficionados, the people who want the rarest items and then want one of each type ever created. They simply want to collect them all. There is nothing wrong with that approach, but from a museum perspective or an actual curator's role, I see a meaningful collection or object as something much more personal. At the Marine Corps Museum, we do not necessarily attempt to bring in lots of examples of things. As a curator, I'm more interested in the items that have a personal connection or a story behind them. These objects can be used to tell you a lot about a person and their life experiences. Perhaps it was a lucky Zippo lighter that the man carried through the war, and he rubbed it for good luck in a way that polished the emblem down after so many battles. Or, it was simply a cheap souvenir handkerchief that a Marine bought overseas and mailed it home to his wife, but was later killed in the battle, and the family kept it and his heart-wrenching letters for decades. These are the artifacts with deeper and meaningful provenance that make for a great museum piece and true keepsake. They bring emotion, they recall memories, and frankly, they meant enough sentimentality to hold on to for years.
So in the case of a great cure artifact, I would count things that have a personal connection to the person that saved it, what it meant to them, and how it shows they feel about the cure. If you saved that set list you grabbed off the stage on your 23rd birthday the night your girlfriend dumped you, and then it's still framed in your 46-year-old grown-up office, that's a fan and a real artifact. In the case of my piece of cure art, it was just a product of my evolving enjoyment of art and music. I was attracted to the mystery and the style of the band. They were dark and exotic, but not cheesy or fake like Kiss or some metal band. So when we were asked in my high school art class to paint a portrait using this odd black ink shadow style, the cure seemed like an obvious choice. It also tells you a bit about our childhood, how it somehow stayed with us and survived countless house cleanings over the years, and how we didn't have access to tons of cool shops that had cool brunish posters or even today's online shops. If we wanted to worship the cure, we sometimes had to think a little more creatively and make our own cool posters. Signed, my brother, Owen Linlithgow Connor, curator of uniforms and heraldry at the National Marine Museum. All right, thanks so much, Owen. This piece of artwork that he created way back when, I'll post a picture on Instagram and Facebook page, of course. But um, yeah, it's just a really cool kind of reverse silhouette, almost in the style of like the in orange cover. Um, but that would have been the obvious easy choice. But so this is a photo from like 85. I believe the photo was taken from the visual documentary book that will probably come up later. But um, yeah, so a cool photo of just Robert in the in all his glory and uh just being the constant fan of my big brother too it was one that i was just so impressed that he he created this art as a young boy i always looked at it as a equally awesome cure poster that hung right up there with the few that we were able to find over the years so um but yeah i love his approach you know like we said there's no wrong answer with this but his approach is that he leans more towards the personal side what has a story behind it um it, like i said it could be something that isn't that rare but maybe this is the record that defined your love for the cure and was given to you on a certain day from a certain person and that's what makes it so special. But let's see what everyone else out there has to say then as we dive into actual artifacts. Dun, dun, dun. All right, our first listener contribution comes in the form of a bit of a combo of what Owen was talking about. Now here we got a rarity that becomes a personal artifact. And um, it uh, comes from Adrian out in Nashville via Instagram. And she sent us an audio clip. So I'll let her explain it in her own words. It was a few years ago in West Palm Beach, Florida, probably about 2015. And I was visiting my family. I went into the most disorganized record store I've ever seen. Everything was in piles and stacks, and it just felt like I was in an episode of Hoarders. And somehow, by the grace of God, I found a copy of Pornography. And I had looked for it for years around Nashville. You'd think in Music City you would have a decent chance of finding it, but I ended up finding it in South Florida of all places. And when I got home and played it for the first time, I realized it was a misprint when I put on side A and the figurehead began to play. And in late 2017, Lawrence came to Nashville towards the end of his book tour and I got him to autograph it for me. And that was a really great experience meeting him. He's a great guy, very down to earth. And it was just so cool to meet somebody that had worked on one of my favorite albums and he told me that he was glad that I liked pornography so much because that was one of his favorites that he worked on and we had a really good talk and yeah that was just a great experience.
Thank you so much, Adrian. We hope to have you back on for a full origin story conversation soon. Um, really appreciate you listening and contributing. And uh, yeah, what a cool find. I didn't even know that was a misprint out there. So pretty cool to have that and then to top it off with a little experience. So pretty neat. Definitely check out Adrian's Instagram account. It's Adrian M. West on the old Instagram. So go check out her site. It's a cool Instagram account. And our next one came from Instagram as well from the uh, handle or username Highbird311. I believe the name is Duffy George. Never really know on Instagram, but um, uh, Highbird311 sent in a link for a creation that uh, Ian made and it's pretty cool because we'll see some some of those too things that people have created I guess much like my brother's art there where um, their most cherished artifact is in fact a um, set of tarot cards that you can actually purchase too it's um, at a website called thegamecrafter.com and uh, if you punch in deep green wish tarot cards you can see this uh, collection of tarot cards that they created and uh, on the site it says I've been a fan of the cure for 30 years and wanted to make a deck of tarot cards as a tribute to my favorite band so I made a major arcana deck and named it after my favorite song and album I believe that reading tarot cards should be fun as it is in insightful and the psychedelic images open your third eye while reflecting the music in corresponding cards. And they look pretty rad if you look at them. You got some live shots that are uh, got all kinds of cool, like you said, psychedelic images over it. Some kind of top imagery. Another one has a, kind of the poor old face from, with day glow face from in between days on there. So everything to check out. We'll put a link to this on the Facebook page too, of course. But uh, you can get them for twelve ninety nine, and uh, you know twenty two cards in the deck. And if you're into tarot cards and you're into the cure, I'd say check it out because this looks like a pretty awesome collection to be proud of too. And you can kind of get another idea of thumbing through what they look like. So pretty cool. I always love a good cure creation and. Um, Thanks so much for uh, tipping us off to this Highbird 311. Moving on to another Instagram contribution. This one came from Cupid Doll, Cupy uh, underscore Doll on Instagram. And uh, it says, My Boys Don't Cry t shirt is my prized possession. I wore it to my first cure gig on July 7th. And uh, also, my original record of Three Imaginary Boys. Thanks. All right, so again, attaching that personal story uh, to a artifact will always help make it a solid part of your life. Thank you so much, Cupid Doll. And next, we have another one from Instagram. This one comes from Nicole, and Nicole wrote in, Hello, uh, my name's Nicole. I am a 19-year-old Cure fan who lives in Denver, Colorado. My favorite Cure artifact is a t-shirt that my mom gave to me when I was very young. She said she got it from a concert circa 1989 when she was 24 and kept it ever since. It is mine now, and out of all my Cure shirts, of which there are many, it is my absolute favorite. So much so that I got the spider on the backside of the shirt tattooed on my arm. So yeah, putting that together, any Cure fan's gonna know, 1989 lullaby so it's an awesome lullaby shirt from the era and um and the tattoo looks amazing so you definitely have to check out the actual image of that um on our facebook page but um how sweet is that a, a, a t-shirt like i said you know the t-shirt might not technically mean anything but that comes from your mom that saw him on the disintegration tour and passed it down to you that's pretty pretty damn beautiful if you ask me so uh again Really cool artifact, and uh, we'll see t-shirts and records popping up quite a bit on this list. So thanks so much, Nicole, and uh, love the pictures. Thank you. All right, here comes a cool one. This one is from Isabel out in Portugal. Isabel writes, So my favorite Cure artifact is actually the 1982 Lament Flexi Disc from Flexi Pop Magazine. See photo. I bought it on a street sale for 5 euros here in Portugal, only a few years back. I know it's nothing special, but there's a good reason for this. Though I already had all the official discography on this or that format, 
the Lament Flexi Disc was the catalyzer for me to start completing the discography of all formats available. So I've been searching for and buying all official and some unofficial discography and videography I can find. Used or new or cassette or vinyl. I already had all the official CDs. But VHS, etc. I don't actually adore the song Lament, but this disc means a lot because of this. Just a final note, I don't see myself as a diehard Cure fan, but the Cure are my favorite band since 1989 when I was only 12. There's not a single day that goes by since the Lullaby single came out that I don't listen to at least one song. Stay safe, have a great 2019. Keep up the great work, much appreciated. Isabel from Portugal. <laughs> I'd say you count as a diehard fan. You're buying everything they ever put out on every format, and you've been a fan since the age of 12, and not a day goes by we don't listen to at least one Cure song. I'd say it's pretty diehard, so don't sell your fandom short, Isabel. Um, love, love the humble nature. Donald hates half their albums, and he does a podcast about The Cure with me. So uh, I think you can as a diehard fan, like it or not. But um, yeah, I love that, that this is, I mean, that's a pretty rare record anyway, but at the same time, that that was the one that has jump-started this massive uh, mission to collect it all. So I see where you're coming from, that this was the guy that did it. So very cool, and um Thanks for your contribution, Isabel. Hopefully talk to you soon. All right, after that, another Instagram. This one's Widful, W-I-D-D-F-U-L, Widful on Instagram wrote, Mine is a fiction EMU exchange copy of pornography, only one of 30. Dang. Or a 1982 Mexican release of pornography, which is also super rare. So... Super rare copies of pornography. I don't even know what EMU means. EMI, maybe, is what they meant. But I don't know. An EMU, one of 30 exchange copies of pornography. That's getting into some serious re record collecting technicalities there. But uh, I knew I should have had Chaz on hand for this one as my uh, Antiques Roadshow record collecting consultant. Um, that's beyond me. So, But good on you. And uh, we got another one from Instagram here. This one's from Springheeled underscore James13. And he writes, My friend's dad gave me a prayer tour shirt with disintegration on the front. And uh, Robert's eyes are on the back. And was recently reproduced by Urban Outfitters of all fucking places. But I wear that tattered old shirt ritually. So that's pretty rad. Another handed down from the era disintegration shirt, much like Nicole's. This is friend's dad. That's even cooler. So, um, yeah, if my uh, son doesn't cherish all my old Cure shirts, maybe I'll give them to one of his friends. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty sweet that these shirts get passed down. I hope to someday pass down all my wonderful 17 seconds shirts, and uh, hopefully they'll be appreciated 40 years from now, 30 years from now, whenever. But you'll have to get them from my dead body. I will never give them up until I'm gone. Anyway, moving on. Instagram, another one. This one's DJ HIC714. Sounds like a stormtrooper. Uh, but anyway, uh, this person writes, mine would be the 40th anniversary concert lanyards from the Hyde Park show. So that's pretty rad. Just a, a nice rare collectible from that show, which was memorable as hell, I bet. So, uh, Lots of good memories associated with that for you, I'm sure. And that lanyard would sum it all up. So, pretty cool. Uh, Lloyd the Void writes, Mine is a front row ticket stub from the Kiss Me Tour. So, yeah, those old ticket stubs from concerts, they're uh, pretty priceless, too. And then uh, will always be a memory from those magical shows. up next we got a very special contribution from someone you all know and love from the show bella bella's back and uh she was very cool and wrote in something that didn't quite match up with the audio so i'm going to read you her message and then play a little audio clip she sent in 
So Bella's prized artifact is in fact her guitar, her Cure Ultra Cure Schechter guitar. And uh, she's heard us talk shit about Schechter in the past and was like, y'all shut the fuck up, you never even played a Schechter guitar. <laughs> so let me tell you about a Schechter guitar. As you kind of already know, I have a Fender. I also have a Taylor Acoustic and two Schechters. These have been acquired over many, many years, and the Schechters happened at the same time. I thought I couldn't afford what I wanted, the Ultra Cure, so I ordered a C1 Platinum instead. Then I found an incredible deal on the Ultra Cure and ended up with two awesome guitars. Merry Christmas to me. I'm not great at recordings, so I will say this in text form. The Cure is inspired by all sorts of art, literature of course, film, probably walks around the foggy and gray beach towns of England. I knew I wanted a guitar, and when I didn't know how to get a sound I really liked without 78 pedals and a chorus effect, etc. Just an incredible sound ready to go, the Ultra Cure was the answer for me. Yes, I look quite top heavy trying to wield this thing, but damn, nothing makes me want to practice and learn more about music than having a guitar that I feel can take over the world simply by having an incredible tone and being extremely versatile. And luckily Bella changed her mind because she's great at recordings and uh, sent in a quick little audio clip. So here's a little bit more on her Ultra Cure. Hello, Holy Hour Podcast. This is Bella. I'm answering the question about what is your favorite cure artifact. So mine is going to cause a bit of dissension, possibly. I have stuff that I've gotten from Cure concerts, and I have t-shirts, and I have my Disintegration album, which is probably one of my favorite artifacts. But I'd have to say that the one that I use the most often, and therefore comes to mind when you ask that question, is my Schechter Ultra Cure guitar. I know you guys aren't super big fans of Schechter. You probably prefer those jazz master fenders but the Schecter for me allows me to explore a sound that I obviously really like right so I like the sound of the cure for 40 years over the span of 40 years so having a Schecter allows me to play anything I want that guitar sounds amazing it's a mahogany body gigantic beast of a guitar and it allows me to explore sound which I can't say a t-shirt though I love them would allow me to do so that is my opinion feel free to argue amongst yourselves but I can't think of anything better than something that allows you to explore creating art hope you guys are having fun talk to you later all right, thanks so much, Bella. As always, a great point and great to hear your perspective because you're right. An artifact that helps you create art is about as awesome as you get, really. So um, the fact that it's cure related, and you know, we are being too hard on Schechter for sure, considering we never even officially played them. You know, so uh, I I'm definitely wanting to track one down, give it a whirl. If it's good enough for the cure, it's gotta sound awesome. So I'm with you. And I will gladly eat my foot now as we move on. Thanks so much, Bella. And, you know, it's only fitting to follow up Bella with her buddy Kelly. We got an audio clip from Kelly, too. So let's hear what Kelly has to say. All right. Good evening. My name's Kelly Kerr. And I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite cure effects. Cure effects. Cure artifacts. I'm a bit of a collector. Kind of a guilty collector. And I, ha you know, I have some interesting pieces. Cure things are kind of hard to come by. I mean, they're not... I, mean, I wouldn't say they're hard. I guess I'm referring to vinyl. Early Cure vinyl is very hard to come by. Because uh, I guess with the vinyl boom, this stuff is a little harder to find or people want stupid amounts of money for it. I'm going to talk to you about a little piece of vinyl that I got on eBay. I think this was back in 2001. I was sitting in my dorm room, and one of the dangers of being 18 years old, 19 years old, and having a Visa debit card for the first time is eBay. And I was buying stuff on eBay 
like nuts my first year of college. This this was like a candy store. This was this eBay was like this haven. You know, I could just get on there and find all kinds of just rare stuff that you had only just read about. You know, things that seemed like it was just a myth, it was on eBay. There was a time when eBay was, you know, had these like golden glory years and and, and 2001 was was one of those years. And it was sometime around Christmas, I think, um, uh, you know, a friend or somebody, I don't really remember who clued me in, but they said, hey, I saw this record on eBay, this this cure record. Um, I'll, you know, just look it up. It's for a song that I've never heard of. And I said, okay, all right, well, so do a search later on that day. And I find this uh, seven inch 45 for a song called uh, See the Children Play. And uh, I know I had never heard this song before. Um, and this was prior to me really finding uh, or you know throwing the money down, I guess, for, for uh, certain rarities of The Cure. There was a, a really great vinyl that kind of collected all the early uh, hands of demos and uh, the, the pre three imaginary boys recordings, uh, a lot of the stuff that Porl had played on. There was a, it was a really great vinyl that kind of collected all that stuff. Um, and I have a copy of it. Um, but, uh, that was before I even acquired that. I, I see this record and all it says on it is, 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 uh, the cure, see the children play 1978, seven inch 45 RPM. It's all it says. There's really no, uh, description and I, I bought it on eBay this is before also before they started doing the buy it now option so you still had to win it I think I paid like you know $18 for it which at the time you know to me was a lot of money you know $18 for a record was just you know I was I was bringing the bank you know uh, to my surprise it was a bootleg uh, it was a white label promo I have never actually seen it on any kind of discography until Discogs kind of became this this big thing um, over the last few years. Um, other than that, I'd never actually seen another another copy of this of this record. It's funny because at the time, that particular semester at school, I did not have a turntable, and so as you can imagine, it was kind of funny that I was buying records. And I wasn't capable of listening to them because I hadn't gotten a new turntable. My brother and I shared one when we were in high school and he took it with him to college and I was left with no turntable. Um, And so I had yet to acquire a new one. So I get this, I get this record. I can't listen to it. It kind of gets filed into the box of records of, you know, whenever I want to get a new turntable, I'll listen to it. I was home in Memphis that 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 Christmas and I and I bought a turntable while I was in Memphis and I brought it back to my dorm room and I immediately started listening to all this stuff that I had acquired for an entire semester of school. And so I put on this record and I hear the song it's called See the Children Play and it sounds like early punk rock cure like you know it's it sounds like that era when they were still doing like that three-piece power trio stuff i have to say it was a pretty cool song you know i could see why it didn't make the cut this song has been sort of readily available since since then uh, but at the time i thought i had something unique neat and unique especially considering there were there were no, uh, it was a white label promo. The, the the sleeve was bootleg as hell. It had a picture of the band from the 80s. And it didn't, you know, it didn't have the original uh, three, three guys on it. So I thought that was kind of funny too. So to me, the most unique aspect of this record and why I've held on to it for so many years and uh, why I've continued to sort of uh, occasionally pull it out and show it to people is the B side on it says at night. And we all know the song at night is on 17 seconds. Well, this particular version of at night is a live version, but it is not the song at night. It is in fact 
the song of forest and the date on uh on this particular version of a forest is dated december 12th 1979 in amsterdam and uh, a little digging tells me that it was quite possibly the first time any of the songs uh that would later appear on 17 seconds were played live and it just so happens somebody put this version of a forest on there and even at the beginning of the song robert says this is called at night and uh the real this really choppy synthesizer comes in i mean it's a real awkward performance of the song because it's really fucking just punk rock it's you know they're still in that mode and they hadn't quite uh slowed down i guess and figured out you know that the song had to sort of breathe and have some space to it and all this stuff um but you could imagine in 1979 you know when when they were gearing up to make another record and they were working on new songs they probably you know and then and then to, to decide to go play these songs live and having to incorporate them within the current their current set uh they were probably very aggressive coming out of the gate but this song uh this version of a forest is very very unique because also because the lyrics are extremely different (laughs) and uh so you can just tell it's almost like they learn they learned some new songs they learned the parts and they went out and played played a couple shows afterwards which i guess is very typical with with a band anywho that's my cure artifact it's a seven inch 45 of two kind of rare unreleased songs that i just kind of took a chance on from ebay all right thanks so much kelly great to hear from you kelly was super nice enough to share with us that version in a clip of a forest known as at night at the time and um, we'll play that at the end of this episode so stay tuned for that and you can hear what this crazy version of a forest sounds like and uh, it's very cool. You don't want to miss it. But we have a couple more things we want to cover first before we go into any full songs. But real quick, we have two more write-ins. The first coming from Morgan. or is it, You can find her on Instagram as some.moreagain. And Morgan writes, uh, The In Orange concert has been really special to my husband and me. I was able to track down a VHS copy for our first anniversary. And it's definitely one of our most cherished artifacts. And here's a picture. And it's a picture of In Orange and Picture Show, which they say is also another personal favorite. Take care, Morgan. And then Morgan also writes another honorable mention, actually, um, is this love song lyrics painting that I did for him shortly after our wedding. And it's a really nice painting um, that has the lyrics for love song all written out there. She says, on top of that, there's a kindergarten level cross stitch monstrosity I made while trying to quit smoking. And uh, we'll put a picture of that as well on our Facebook page, but it looks really cool. It's the hand from Wish um, with the eyes on the fingers there and the C from the Cure Wish font on the hand there. It looks really cool. So um, two creation pieces that are very cool, and no one's going to argue the uh, personal attachment level to the VHS of In Orange that I'm sure we all have dear to our hearts and hope that our VHS players VCRs, I think we call them right still. Don't destroy our copies of In Orange. So it's always a gamble every time you play anything in a VCR, don't you think? Um, All right, moving on. Thank you, Morgan. To our last write-in is from Sylvia. And Sylvia writes, Choosing which is my most cherished Cure artifact has been quite hard. At first, I thought about the Cure mixtape that a friend of my dad gave to him, which is probably the main reason why the Cure seemed so familiar to me on first listen eight years ago. Then I thought about the books I have about them, like Obscure or Visual Documentary, etc. Or I have sketchbooks filled with all kinds of Cure stuff. But then I came to a conclusion, my most cherished Cure artifact is my copy of Wish. Why, you might ask? It's because I'm attached to the memory of how I found it. It was August in my hometown, and they usually organize a sort of vinyl festival, more like an open-air record market. I was still new to the Cure's discography, but the first album that made me fall in love with their music was actually Wish. 
it's impossible to find on vinyl and very expensive, especially for a 16-year-old girl. That night, I was out with a friend of mine walking around and I was starting to feel dizzy. At the time, I didn't know I had a fever. So my friend let me lean on the nearest street lamp. And there, I saw a record seller showing somebody, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. Finally, someone who sells Cure records, I thought. And so I got a closer look to his boxes full of records, and I started hunting. There were so many rare records, my mind still goes back to that night thinking, if only I had more money. But among all those gems, I found Wish, and I think my heart skipped a beat, and it was worth it. However, I was afraid about its price, so I asked the seller, and he said since he didn't like Wish at all, he sold it to me for 15 euros, and yes, my heart exploded. This little anecdote could seem silly, but at the time, and at that age, I felt like I'd found the Holy Grail. I hope you like this cure memory. Regards, Sylvia. Yes, I do. Thank you, Sylvia. And it's funny how, like, how... The hunt is part of it, you know, and the memories attached, as you said. It's so important because, you know, on the surface level, it can just seem like just a record, but that's what makes the artifact side of it or the that missing piece of your collection so important and uh, why each little piece is so important. And I love hearing about these stories, and it always gives you hope, um, especially as a record collector or something like that, that you could find something amazing like that just kind of in the middle of, so of something. You would think everybody at this point would know that they could overcharge for Wish or something, but not only just finding it, but finding it for a great price. Ah, it's every record hunter's dream, right? So thank you so much for sharing, Sylvia. And speaking of record hunters, if you've been listening to this show, you know our buddy Chaz is not only the expert t-shirt maker in the group, but he also has a hell of a record collection. Is his most cherished artifact one of his records? Let's go find out. I had the pleasure of actually hanging out with Chaz and getting a first-hand account of what his favorite, most cherished Cure artifact is. Let's see. All right, we're here in person with Chaz. Thanks for letting me uh, invade your home. No problem. <laughs> and uh, we figured what better time than to get some recording in uh, for this episode of we know you've got some great artifacts, so uh, we figured let's go through some of Chaz's most pride possessions for uh, which uh, was it hard to narrow down? I yeah, think just the yeah. Little while I, I've been here, you've got quite a few to choose yeah. from. I think I grabbed way too many, <laughs> but it is what it is. Yeah, why not? So, um, what you got there? So we got uh, a jumping someone else's train, seven inch. Nice. That was signed by Lull. Cool. So, you take I mean, it to one of the. Yeah, I took it to the, um, the, the book thing he did in in Philadelphia. Right. On. So he was pretty awesome with it. Uh, I didn't know if he was gonna sign the book or if he was gonna sign other stuff. Right. On. So some dude showed up and he had like, a whole stack, thirty things, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, come on. I'm man. like, I felt bad for bringing two records with me <laughs> and the book. So. Yeah. And I, I actually gave one of the records to my son who I brought with me. Right on. And if you guys hear dogs in the background, I'm sorry, they're playing underneath the table. Yeah, our special guest, yeah. we're going to ask what their prize yeah. position is at the end of the yeah. <laughs> episode. Um, but so yeah, it's not uh, me snarking, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what's Gavin doing? <laughs> <laughs> He's just salivating at these gear yeah. So, But yeah, and then I got a, a Boys Don't Cry 7-inch. Nice. Uh, first press or whatever that was signed by Lowell also so awesome. uh you know it's just cool because i i do associate that with taking my son yeah so that That's was a... cool um he had a fun time he sat down next to Lowell and they talked for a little bit so cool. that was cool and talked about instruments and my son had a bunch of questions that he asked him so he was really oh, good wow. with it so you know cool well, yeah, yeah those are great yeah. it's just i love those covers and everything cool. just like be so cool just to have them but to have it autographed and be there yeah. when it's got signed is so great they definitely have like a you know more like a diy yeah kind of look to it's... it compared to future releases which i like especially the boys don't cry yeah seven inch it looks like somebody actually took time and like yeah. sat down and actually designed it and like showed it to them it was just like you know <laughs> we're gonna like kind of early band stage kind of yeah thing. yeah you know cut and paste yeah and the same like thing with the photo with the jumping uh someone else's train seven inch just like the cutout mouths and everything yeah 
so you won't see in future releases, nah. which I kind of like. So yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I've got a bad bootleg one of those. I got all excited when I saw the shop, but it's just yeah. like pulled out and it had like a picture of him from the top era or something. <laughs> and I was like, hey. I have one of those two in the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, yeah, I'll take is, it. This is, this is not the same record. Yeah. <laughs> nah, yeah. Let's go. Oh, uh, uh, what else you get there? So I got the Love Box uh, mm. box thing, which is really cool because I got it. I actually got it off of eBay. Uh huh. And. This is like two years ago, two or three years ago, and I was really concerned not paying too much for it just because I already have a couple yeah. love songs seven inches. So I got it, and I knew it came with the yeah. What is it? It's little like a cloth. Thing. Yeah, a little cloth. When I was taking out the seven inch, behind the seven inches were two tickets. Oh wow! For shows in '92. Um, one is where's this one at? Uh, I don't know if you can tell. Hmm. I forget. So these are just all in. They there. were in there. Edinburgh. Edinburgh Playhouse, yeah. yeah. And then this one is for. Um, I don't know if that was the venue or not. Yeah, it sounds like so. it would be. But... And then this one is Card Hall and Dundee. Cool. But then I flipped it over on the back, ah. and it, it was autographed. Yeah, this is November twenty first, ninety two, for the Edinburgh one. And Dundee. Dundee. Hmm. With an autograph. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. A little so, bonus. That's yeah. great. <laughs> I thought the ticket was really cool because it's got that uh, weird red bird kind of thing. Yeah. From, that's... Uh, from the Wish album on it. So I was like, oh, that's cool. And then like I was reading the stuff on the back. And then I flipped this one over and it's got four autographs. Looks like. Make yeah. Those out. It's like yeah. Robert, Boris, mm-hmm. Simon. Simon, and I don't know who that is. Perry, maybe? Possibly. Like yeah, yeah, it looks like P-E-R. Yeah. yeah, Perry. Cool. So, yeah, so that's... The whole curves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was a pretty interesting find. And yeah. Like, I think I paid, like, 20 bucks for it. So, yeah. like, I don't even know if they Jeez. knew they were still in there. Yeah, I wonder they sold if it. that slipped by somebody so, or not. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy about that. It was that's a good investment. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then... I know I've brought this up on the podcast before, but this one, it's a Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me album. Uh, I originally had this, it's one of the first Cure records that I bought uh-huh. <clears throat> um, from Double Decker in Allentown uh, back in the late 90s, and uh, I had a girlfriend in college that wanted to borrow it, so I let her borrow that, and couple other cure records and like i know i let her ba- borrow bad brains record and some other stuff uh-huh. and uh then we broke up and i never saw the records uh, again yeah. so and this is the one that i lost uh, so when my wife and i started first dating uh you know we talked about music and everything and it came, we talked about exes and how shitty they were and i told her what happened and then uh like the next day she went to vintage vinyl in st louis and she saw this in the dollar bin oh man and she bought it for me and like we, we <laughs> met like she came up to chicago to see me and like we she came in my shitty studio apartment <laughs> and she handed it to me and i was like like i was so overjoyed <laughs> still got the hype sticker on it and yeah, it was pretty awesome. much perfect condition yeah it looks great that's... wear around the corners that you would never see in another dollar bin like especially now that's so, awesome yeah so right. it was definitely a prized possession of mine just because of that story so yeah, yeah. cool so, um mm. and then it's another it's like all right i guess we're getting married now yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah um awesome. all right and then the last right. two i have here this one's fallen out of the frame so oh, yeah. but uh these are first one is a gold uh, R-I-A-A award for uh, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me Dang. with the record and cassette. Nice. Uh, and that certifies that 500,000 copies were sold in the United States. Awesome. Um, and it was awarded to John Cook at KKBQ. Oh, wow. his name on there, huh? Yeah. So, um, John Cook. 
He passed away. Oh. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I I did some research on it's it because I was shame yeah, him. <laughs> I was like because when they uh, they originally this is also from Double Decker they got in um, uh-huh. a large quantity of this with like other bands like they had a they had a bunch of Depeche Mode, um, say like Tom Petty. Huh. It was kind of like all over the place, but a lot of it was focused on. Like, 80, 80s music, 90s, a little, a little early 90s. There, It was there, because they had, just had stacks of them. Yeah. And uh, they were all for the same guy. So, I was asking the guy who owns the store, like, how do you get it? He's like, some guy just came through with a bunch of them, and yeah, I bought them sense. all, and they're, I'm selling them, so. Yeah. My grandpa had a whole bunch of those. The guy lived in New Jersey, actually. He worked for MCA through the 80s and okay. stuff. Okay, yeah, And yeah. did, like, promotion. He was the guy that would go to, like, the tape and record yeah. stores and be like, hey, you got to get more units of this. Yeah. And, and uh, so he'd have them all over his house, like Lionel Richie ones okay, and okay, stuff yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. So it makes sense now. Yeah. I have, like, all these ones of, like, bands I don't really know what to yeah. do with, yeah. like Elton John and stuff. I'm like, they're cool, but... Uh, so yeah, yeah I, I always was wondering. It's like, yeah, I've seen fake ones on eBay and stuff like that, yeah. where, they're, where they're just like gold, quote unquote, gold plated <laughs> records, <laughs> right and on. like they're cool for just you know to put up on the wall or whatever. Yeah. But they're not. I mean, they don't have the official seal or whatever. So yeah, it's yeah, awesome. I think it's, it's I think like it's a... pretty cool. But yeah, he I think he was in Austin, Texas, if I remember right. Okay, and he passed away and. I think like 2013 or something like that, and I probably they probably had an estate sale. Yeah, and somebody yeah, just came through and bought them all, them. and then came north and sold them all to Double Decker. So yeah, yeah. So this one's well, kind of cool. falling apart. We'll keep the and, yeah. legacy going there, and <laughs> yeah. one day I'll it's pay like, to have it reframed. Yeah, no, but, it's awesome. Yeah, not anytime soon, but uh, and then going off of that uh, is a. Platinum copy of Disintegration. Going platinum now. With a million copies sold. <laughs> uh, and it, it comes with the record, CD, and uh, cassette. Yeah. Which I've wondered, because you don't know what the CD is. Yeah. <laughs> and the cassette it doesn't have any <laughs> tape in it. So obviously yeah. that's that's fake. And yeah, the CD, it's got the grooves on it right here. So you can tell that it doesn't go out all the way. Yeah. So it's not... It's... It's probably like an instructional. It deep says, video. "Why would you yeah. try to play this? Yeah. Shame yes. on you!" <laughs> so, but it's like a recording. I, I'm wondering about the record if it's an actual disintegration record, yeah. or they just plop the, the label on it. But yeah, you could compare the yeah. grooves, maybe. Yeah, to I that. thought about doing that, but I'm just like, eh. yeah, it's a, yeah. But it's got the cool some things. Some doors are best not yeah. open, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, that looks awesome. Though. Yeah, it really but, looks. Just the, a cool design. The and... seal changed from that one to this one, so it's a little different. Awesome, yeah. This one's kind of like, kind of a classic one, and this one's kind of like a 90s. Yeah, it looks like a upper deck yeah, baseball yeah, card. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, but yeah, then it's got the it's got the CD or the album cover artwork there, which is really cool. Same thing with the Kiss Me one, yeah. right there. But it doesn't. It's not the actual. This is this is the actual artwork. That one's just looks like, like blown one. up. Yeah. So I like this one a little bit more, and plus it's the platinum copy. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, there there's a few of these floating around. Is it? Does it have his name on it? Yeah, is John it Cook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, different radio station now. Yeah. Nine thirty. Hmm. And then unless it's the, mm. I don't know the. I yeah. Say. Yeah. So, Pretty They're cool. giving out to, like you said, people that do promotion work for the album, and uh, I know I've been in the the rock, the major rock station in Philadelphia, MMR, and when you go in there, they have them plastered all over the wall, so yeah. I assume that a lot of radio stations get them, and depending on probably how many times you play them and whatnot, so. Right. <clears throat> so, yeah, so this is kind of cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Those are some awesome treasures for sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and like we talked about at the top of this episode, it's crazy the different perspectives of, like, just collectibles and 
the ones that can be something that everybody has, but if yeah. it has a personal attachment to it, then that takes it in a whole different angle. And so uh, it's pretty cool. You got a little of everything here. So that sums up exactly yeah. what we <laughs> have been talking about. So. I mean, I could literally go through my entire record collection with you tonight. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we were joking, saying we should do it, just list every record. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we'll save that for uh, yeah. episode 335 when we're really <laughs> hurting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, pretty impressive. Do you mind if we take pictures of these yeah, and put no, them on the Facebook? Yeah. And yeah, I come. I tried to, you know, I tried to break it down between stuff I've found because I think that's really cool, like yeah. part of the hunt, and then uh, just something per- personal, and then just something just really kind of obscure yeah. that people aren't going to have. Which you know, I, and like I, I make T-shirts, but I'm not a T-shirt guy. So yeah, I have a few T-shirts upstairs, like older shirts, but nothing that. As a huge... I don't really have an attachment to them. Yeah, so I think this stuff is more of because another thing with the with the with the awards, uh, I had to go to work that night uh-huh. and I couldn't go up to get them, so I was freaking out because he wasn't going to hold them for anybody. Right. So I'm just like, I, <laughs> I'm never going to get them. You know, yeah. these are two things that I really want, and I'm never going to see them. And my wife. Like, as soon as I left the door for work, my wife threw the kids in the car, <laughs> and she drove up there and got them for me. Oh, wow. And when I got home, they were waiting for me. Awesome. So, yeah. yeah, that's so, good. She feeds into this whole uh, <laughs> yeah, obsession. Like, Thanks for sharing, man. No problem. Many more adventure stories to come. Thanks for sharing your artifacts. No problem. <laughs> All right, so cool getting to hang out with Chaz. Thanks so much for your time, bud. And um, thank you guys so much for contributing so much to this episode, even if it was just a quick write-in. Um, it always means a lot to get as many people involved in these as possible. And uh, I really enjoyed piecing this one together. I hope it made sense. Um, special thanks to everyone that contributed. Sylvia, Duffy, Adrian, Cupid Doll, Isabel, Widful, is spring Hill Jim, uh, DJ H1C714, Lloyd the Void, Morgan, and of course Bella and Kelly. It was great hearing your voices again, and um, especially my big brother Owen for coming up with this idea and uh, setting us straight on artifacts in a professional manner. So thank you so much, Owen. And uh, for me, I don't know, what's my special artifact? It's hard to say. For as much as I love the cure and um, love collecting things, I don't really have a lot of like cure collecting stuff other than the essential records and a lot of bootlegs and a lot of singles. But I don't have a little, I don't have everything and I don't try to have everything because I feel like there's just so much out there. It's really weird. I don't even know what my, my, my uh, prized possession would be after doing all this, but I, I guess I got to give some kind of answer. So I guess I would have to go with, um, I really cherish that dumb visual documentary book just because of the way I had it at such a young age. It was the only glimpse. I got that before I'd seen any actual videos. So I had this book full of pictures that I just carried around like my Bible at that point. And I got the the whole lump sum of their history. I got so many pictures of this band. I was so fascinated with their images that I just basically slept with that book under my pillow every night for years it felt like and um so it was really something special but i realized it is just a book on top of that um just a t-shirt you know but it isn't just a t-shirt i got this t-shirt that i talk about all the time i think um i got it in the initial trade with my buddy jeff butler when he was getting rid of his cure stuff he traded me or sold it to me rather um he sold me I think it was pornography and 17 seconds. No, I think I got 17 seconds later. But it was like a couple of the early tapes and um, and a Kiss Me t-shirt. The white Kiss Me t-shirt with the lip on it and the eye on the back. I have it to this day. It's one of my only original Cure t-shirts that I didn't somehow lose or ruin over the years. And it's worn so thin that it's disgusting to wear without something under it. Um, it just looks completely different than if you see a new one online or something i love it but um it just reminds me of that early acquisition and uh, my early love for the cure that was the moment that once i got those artifacts from jeff butler i knew that I, it was game on i was a diehard fan at that moment on and i uh, still have that damn t-shirt and wear it occasionally for special occasions it's not the most flattering and it looks kind of gross but it's uh my first cure t-shirt ever and uh very personal but you know what to even leave on a more cheesy note 
my most cherished cure artifact is this this goofy old podcast i think having over a hundred episodes categorized and documented hopefully forever on the internet of uh just me and all these wonderful people and wonderful friends sharing our cure memories and putting all this cure nonsense together i love it and um you know i'm super proud of it even though it's pretty slapstick at times um you know i think that this this thing is my most cherished cure artifact and i couldn't do it without you guys so uh All right, sorry to step on uh, this song by talking over the end here, but uh, hopefully it'll stop me from getting sued. And um, you can do a little hunting of your own. Go out and find this song yourself. It's out there, maybe. I don't know. Okay, so um, be sure to subscribe on iTunes. iTunes is where you'll never miss an episode of the Holy Hour podcast. And now completely on YouTube too. All episodes will be on YouTube, hopefully forever. Holy Hour podcast, Instagram, the Holy Hour podcast, and uh, Facebook page is where you'll see, especially for episodes like this, all kinds of cool photos of stuff we're talking about and extra links. So go over to the Facebook page, like the page too, don't just look at the stuff you know that way you'll know when when stuff like this pops up for every episode so go on over there like that page and um drop me any line you want at gavinconnor at gmail.com and uh keep your ears peeled to anything else if you dig spotify or stitcher or any of that business or google something i think we're on that so any of those out there you can uh, follow the podcast on those outlets as well until next time, 1979 version of a forest from Kelly's Rare 45. Take it easy, guys. Talk hard. Talk hard.